This is not going to be a fun video to film, is it? Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. My name is Amy and I was diagnosed with the wrong illness for 14 years. So, this story is all about how I have bile acid malabsorption, which was recently diagnosed, but for 14 years I was diagnosed with IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, and even though I was pretty certain that that was not the issue that I had, I was consistently, constantly, continually told that that was what it was. I also just want to say before I start this that I love the NHS. I think it is one of the most amazing things about our country. However, in this situation, for me, I do feel that I was failed many, many times by the doctors I saw through the NHS. But I just wanted to say that this video is not me bashing the NHS at all. I'm just telling you my experience. Okay, so first I will tell you about my misdiagnosis story and the journey that I took with that. And then I'll talk to you about bile acid malabsorption and what it is. Also, need to let you know, I am not a doctor, so anything I say in this video is purely from my own experience, from talking to doctors and my own research throughout the years. I also want to let you know that I will be discussing bodily functions, so just be aware of that. So, if we go back to when this kind of first started, I was about 13 or 14 years old. Everything up until that point health-wise had been pretty normal. But suddenly I just started to get a really upset stomach in the mornings. And by upset stomach, I, I mean diarrhea, I mean diarrhea, okay? Let's not beat around the bush about this, okay? Bodily function, very normal thing to happen, not so nice when it's happening all the time. So I started getting it in the morning and I'd have stomach pain, like cramping, and I'd have to go to the loo a few times. And it was really annoying because it wasn't very helpful for my mum and my sister who needed to get to work and to school and they were waiting for me and I was stuck in the toilet and it just wasn't very nice for me because it's not nice. I just assumed that I had some kind of tummy bug. I continued going to school because in my house you do not stay home from school unless you are on your deathbed or you have a temperature of like 102. So I thought I had this bug, but it continued for a number of weeks and it started getting worse. I would have to leave my morning classes to rush to the toilet and I started missing parts of my lesson. I felt awful. I just felt so ill and just drained, which I guess basically I was. So at this point, my mum took me to the doctor. We visited the GP quite a few times about this and very quickly the GP decided that this was just IBS. Now let's just pause for a moment here so that I can tell you that if you ever refer to IBS as just IBS or a bit of IBS or only IBS, stop doing that, especially if you are a medical professional. IBS is such a spectrum. So you can have people on one end who get a bit of gas and get a bit of cramping, but they're generally fine, all the way to the other end where it is extremely debilitating for people, which is where I, spoiler, end up. And so to be told that something is just or only because it is a functional illness <laughs> is really, really frustrating and quite insulting to be honest when you're going through that much pain and you feel really ill all the time to be told that it's just a bit of nothing is horrible anyway i digress let's carry on the gp gave me some tablets they were anti-spasmodics and none of them worked so there weren't really many that they could give me to try they gave me something called buscopan which is something you can actually get over the counter again i'm not a doctor i'm not recommending any of these things to you and that didn't work when i went back to the gp and explained that buscopan did not work she said well it must do because it works for me what do you even say to that my 
symptoms, by the way, were continuing to get worse all of this time. And the doctor just says it works for them, so it must work for me. I wasn't lying about this. I didn't want to have this. So luckily I was still taking my mum with me to my doctor's appointments and she stood up for me and said, well, demanded that we see a specialist. Pretty much any time I went to the GP about this, they were very dismissive. I saw maybe two or three different ones because I didn't always end up seeing the same one. Yeah, as a as a 13 slash 14 year old who's going through this really confusing time and is feeling awful all the time and no one really takes you seriously, it's difficult to explain really because as an adult now that I've been through all of this and lots of other health issues, if a doctor was being dismissive and wasn't taking me seriously, then I would argue my case and I would refuse that kind of treatment and maybe see a different doctor. But at 13 or 14, you go to your doctor, even as an adult, you go to your doctor and you trust them. They are someone who you're supposed to be able to trust, who you should be able to trust to take care of you and want to take care of you. And so you'll see throughout this story that I saw many dismissive doctors and that is really difficult. So my symptoms continued to get a lot worse. They were happening any time of day. I was getting stomach aches all the time throughout the day. I would have to be running to the loo all the time during the day. It would just come on. It would just be so unpredictable, which I think also was another aspect that is really difficult to manage when you have a condition that is extremely unpredictable and one minute you feel fine and the next minute you feel awful and you have to run to the toilet and my life started revolving around where toilets were. Apologies if the camera angle changed a little bit there, I had a bit of a technical issue. Where was I? So life revolved around being near a toilet. Wherever I went, I had to know where the toilets were and to make sure that there were enough of them, I would try to make sure that I was as prepared as possible. If I had to go on a long journey, that scared me so much. The thought of being stuck on the M25, for example, and then having a flare up, which is what I started to call these episodes, was terrifying. I would get incredibly anxious. I still do get incredibly anxious if I have to go somewhere that I've never been before or that is far away, because what if I have a flare up? Not many people knew what was going on with me, really just my parents and my sister, I suppose. The pain had also got a lot worse and I was just constantly in pain, in some level of pain. I would have stomach aches and cramping and that could range anywhere from like a two on the pain scale to when I was having really awful flare ups, a nine or 10 on the pain scale. So it had become a very different beast in a very short amount of time. At times, the abdominal pain would get so bad that I would pass out. But to be honest, the times that I passed out were the better times because when I wasn't passing out, I was in that pain and I was wishing that I would just pass out from it. So my mum demanded that I be referred to a specialist. So that's a gastroenterologist. I was passed from specialist to specialist, never really ever seeing the same one twice. I couldn't even tell you how many doctors I have seen. The, I just, I couldn't possibly count them. They were all incredibly dismissive. This was IBS and this was a young girl who had IBS who was making a big deal out of the fact that she had IBS because she didn't want to have IBS. That was basically how I was treated and I know that there is this culture of not believing particularly women in the medical profession. Young women, young girls, for some reason just aren't believed. I didn't want to keep going to the hospital or to the doctor. I just wanted everything to stop. And for some reason, doctors just didn't want to help me. And it was, 
like I said, these are people who you're supposed to be able to trust. And I couldn't trust them. They didn't have my best interests at heart. They just didn't. And I'm not saying that that is all doctors at all. I'm not saying that that's these particular doctors all of the time. But unfortunately, in my case, that was my experience. I would go to them, I would explain for the 50th time what was going on with me because every time I saw a new specialist, which was pretty much every time I went to the hospital, I had to explain again what was going on. They would say, so why are you here? And I'd think, surely you can please just, just read my notes so I don't have to go over this again because it's so hard to go over. I've actually kind of been dreading making this video because even now it's very difficult to talk about. So every time I saw a specialist, I would take my mum with me until I got a little bit older. I started to feel more confident going on my own and advocating for myself. Every time they said this was just IBS, there was nothing really you could do. We would explain again how severe my symptoms were getting and how much they were affecting my life. And so I was sent for lots of tests. I had stool sample tests, urine tests, so many blood tests. I had a couple of MRIs, a CT, a couple of colonoscopies. I've had a couple of sigmoidoscopies. I've had gastroscopies. I'm sure there are other things that I've had as well and I'm just not quite remembering to add them to the list. But a lot of tests, a lot of poking and prodding that obviously I didn't want, but any time they said that they would do a test, would I be happy to do this test? I would say, of course I am. I'm willing to do anything for you to figure out what is wrong with me. I was so desperate. Some of these tests were really horrible to go through. No one wants to have a colonoscopy. No one wants to have a gastroscopy. No one wants to have a sigmoidoscopy. No one wants to do these things. No one wants to drink that horrible stuff you have to drink before you have a CT. But I would do it all a hundred times because I just wanted to know what was wrong with me. I cannot even explain how desperate I felt and how alone I felt. I couldn't... I couldn't tell many people what was going on because I was embarrassed and I also didn't have much to tell them. I could say I've been diagnosed with IBS but no one really took that seriously. It didn't really explain the severity of my symptoms and so if I had to go into that I didn't really want to do that. So I have been brought up to be very resilient and to kind of you know just keep come and carry on that kind of thing and that was extremely difficult to do and I'm not saying that you know my parents did anything wrong of course they didn't my mum did absolutely everything she could to try and get to the bottom of what was going on and I know it must have been extremely hard for my parents to see me going through this and to not be able to fix it for me I can't imagine how difficult that was for them You would think that the amount of time that has passed, the amount of times I've had to retell this story to different doctors and different people, you'd think that by now talking about it wouldn't make me so emotional, but it's still so difficult to think about because it was so hard to go through. You know, I get flashbacks of really awful flare-ups that I've had and there are certain places that I go to or certain things that remind me of really awful flare-ups that I've had. So I had lots and lots of tests over many many years and I was also sent to a dietitian for quite a while. I tried all of the different diets that are supposed to help. I cut out things like dairy, gluten, I tried the low FODMAP diet, I tried the candida diet which is where you take away any yeast and sugar in your diet. I 
tried so many different ones and none of them worked. My symptoms continued over the years to get a lot worse. Aside from often having to use the toilet up to 10 times a day and constantly being in pain, I was never not in pain, the pain could also get so bad during a flare up that at times I felt like I was dying and that is no exaggeration. This pain was such that there was no other thought that my brain could comprehend other than I am dying because this pain is so awful. And if I wasn't thinking that, I was wishing that I would. How do you just get up the next morning and pretend like everything's fine when you know that last night you either felt like you were dying or wished that you would because the pain is so bad you can't take it anymore. The only respite I would get would be if I passed out. It's really not obviously a nice thing to talk about and it's not something that I really like putting out there. But I think it's really important that I do because I know for a fact that there will be other people going through what I have been through. I think it's really important to talk about these experiences that we have because not only is it healing for us, it's really important to spread the word and to connect people who otherwise feel very, very alone. I ended up in A&E sometimes with the pain because it was so bad, although most of the time when it was that bad, I couldn't get to the hospital because I couldn't leave the toilet. So we would just have to try and manage it at home. I was very depressed because not only was I having to go through all this physical pain, which how are you supposed to have a healthy mind if your body is always in pain, but also the fact that it had been years and I still wasn't having answers and I was still being dismissed by doctors and I just, I worried constantly about what was wrong with me, when the next flare up was going to come, and they were very frequent, and also if this was ever going to end, would it continue to get even worse? I couldn't even imagine how the pain could get any worse, but it had kept getting worse since it first started. Pretty much my symptoms ruined my life every single day. There are definitely things that I wasn't able to do, or I didn't do for fear of having a flare up. Having flare ups in public was so terrifying, isolating, embarrassing. Every time a doctor told me there was nothing else that could be done, I had to argue or beg for them not to discharge me. So many times I was told that they were just going to discharge me from their service and I would have to beg them or argue with them to let me stay on their service because I knew that once I was discharged, that was it. I was never going to get an answer. I couldn't bear the idea of being in that much pain for much longer. Quite honestly, life felt impossible and hardly anyone knew what I was going through. My teachers didn't know, my friends didn't really know. I just kind of tried to carry on as normal, looking normal, whatever that means, and that honestly was almost as exhausting as the illness itself. Trying to put on this front and constantly having to come up with reasons that I needed to nip out of a conversation when really I just needed to go to the toilet or I was in a lot of pain. But I didn't want my life to revolve around this illness. I wanted this kind of separation. Unfortunately, my life did revolve around this illness and so nothing really fit together. I think I had to grow up much sooner than I should have done. Most of my friends were just living very carefree and I didn't have that luxury anymore. And as I got older, going to university, that was really hard. I've had to leave jobs because of my illness. And when I got to university, the first year was so hard I almost quit because of the illness and the impact it was having on my life and on my studies. And then, I met a group of friends who were the nicest people and 
were extremely supportive and understanding and slowly but surely I felt that I could trust them and be more open with them. I started being more open in general just about my illnesses. It definitely took a weight off being able to say, actually, I'm having a really bad flare up. So at age 27, I finally received a diagnosis, the real diagnosis. And it was kind of by accident. I don't really want to say by accident because the doctor was great. So I have recurrent pancreatitis, calls yet to be determined. And I was seeing a gastroenterologist about that. And he noticed from my file because he actually read my history, my medical history. He said, oh, I've noticed that you've had really severe IBS symptoms and you know they really impact your life and he talked to me about the symptoms and he said that I'm not sure if this is linked to your pancreatitis or not but I think we should do this test. He said to me have you ever heard of bile acid malabsorption and I said no I've never heard of that before no doctor's ever mentioned it and he said okay I'm going to book you in for this scan. Now I think it's referred to as a CCAT scan but I could be saying that wrong it's a SEH CAT scan and it's pretty simple so I went to the hospital for the scan and what I had to do was swallow a tablet that had some radiation in it that's a safe amount and then I had to go away for three hours come back and have a scan and I was scanned for about five to ten minutes on my abdomen so they did one scan at the front and one scan at the back and I was just sat in a chair the whole time a week after that I went back for the same scan again. I didn't have to take a tablet again, I just had the same scan again. And I'm not a doctor, but from what I understand, they were looking to see how the radiation had moved through my body, how much was still left in my body, and that would tell them how bile salts or bile acids, I think that's interchangeable, were moving through my body. I then went back to see the doctor once he had the results from the scan. He said that the radiation had moved through my body very quickly and that there was a lot less left in my body than they would normally expect in a healthy patient. This meant that bile salts or bile acids made in my liver were not behaving in the way that they should be. They weren't being absorbed properly by my body and instead were ending up in my intestines where they should not be absorbed. However, once they get into my intestines, my intestines then try to absorb them there. And that causes problems. This meant that I had bile acid malabsorption or bile salt malabsorption. No diets could have fixed it. The other tests I had, the ones that we kept repeating because I refused to be discharged, were pointless. For about 14 years, my symptoms had continued to get worse and worse until they were quite severe, impacted my life in a way that I, I, it's difficult to get across in one video. And now I found out that this one test could have saved me 14 years of pain and suffering. And a lot of time and money on the NHS's part, I guess. Now I'm assuming that this test that I had was fairly expensive but after years and years and years I don't understand why no other doctor ever mentioned it, offered it. I would have paid to have it if a doctor had said to me we think that it's worth you having this test but we can't offer it to you on the NHS. If they had said that to me I would have found the money because I was so desperate to find out what was wrong with me. So as you can probably imagine, I was sitting in this doctor's office and he's just told me that he's found the reason for all of my symptoms. And I was in absolute shock, absolute shock, because I'm so used to having so many tests and then them coming back with nothing. But this one test could have prevented all of those years of pain and suffering because there is treatment for bile acid malabsorption. There's no cure. I'll be taking medication for the rest of my life, but I'm fine with that. I have a little sachet and it's got medication in it. And I take that up to three times a day, every day. I have to put it in liquid. It doesn't fully dissolve. It doesn't taste that great, to be honest. I don't enjoy taking it at all, but I will continue to do so. 
I will take it for as long as I have to. But that little sachet has changed my life. Things aren't perfect. I can still have flare-ups. I still experience pain. I still experience some flare-ups, but they are few and far between and less severe. That one doctor saved my life. Not because bile acid malabsorption was going to kill me, but because I could not live with those symptoms for the rest of my life. I was just one patient in his day, but he completely changed the way that I get to live my life now. As I said, it's not perfect and we've still got a way to go to see how this all works. I haven't had this medication for that long and for quite a large period of time taking this medication, I've been pregnant. So that has also brought with it its own issues and symptoms. So we still have to give this medication some time to really shine on its own but so far the results have been very positive. I think about what could have been different if I had discovered this diagnosis sooner. I think about why I had to go through all of that. What was the point? I don't know if I'll ever get over all of it because it was a big chunk of time and a big chunk of my life and a lot a lot of pain. I think it's something that I'll kind of be working through for a very long time. If one person watching gets something out of this then I will feel like it was a video worth making. Let me know in the comments if you can relate to any of this and if this video was helpful at all. Apologies for the emotion in the middle. I shouldn't really apologise for emotion really, should I? I will link below some information about bile acid malabsorption if you want to read into it further. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know in the comments if you made it to the end of this video because I'm pretty sure it's going to be a long one. And I will see you next time.